So I'm Nick Birch, Director of Engineering at a company called Fleck in the UK. Um, as I go through my talk, I'm going to be putting up snippets of code. Most of them are too small to read, especially at the back, but fear not. Every bit of code on my slides is also on GitHub. So are the slides, so if there's any bits that you're interested in and I run a bit too fast over, you can get it later. Um, also, if you spot any bugs in my code, pull requests welcome. So just give you a sec to get that one up. Everyone good? Right. Okay, so it's not quite going to be your traditional AI talk. It's going to be about AI text and Wordle. A little bit at the start is going to be about kind of AI in general. Then we're going to work our way through some of the things that are important when you're working with ML and text. And we're going to use Wordle as our example. So what is AI? What is ML? Why are we at a buzzwords conference talking about it? So Larry Tesla's theorem, AI, artificial intelligence, is whatever hasn't been done yet, which makes ML, machine learning, the things that we can do today. First big AI bubble, possibly a few of you in the room were around for it, most of you not, myself included, was in the mid-80s. Over a billion US dollars in 1980s money, which was a lot more, was put down on AI startups that were generally touted as expert systems. There were two problems that those companies faced and caused them to fail. One of them is there wasn't enough training data available. And the second one is the computers were more expensive than the experts they were trying to get rid of. But Moore's law to the rescue, what used to cost a million dollars in 1985, it's under a dollar a day. In terms of the amount of memory you can get on machines, this is getting a little bit worrying to me. One terabyte of memory on Amazon, it's about a latte an hour. Four terabyte machine, $25 an hour. Six terabyte machine now, $55 an hour. All sorts of problems that you didn't used to fit on your laptop now fit in memory for $50 an hour. And if you have a friendly Amazon account manager, they will in theory give you a quote for a 48 terabyte of memory machine, which just kind of blows my mind. But almost any problem that you can think of that used to be impossible on a laptop fits in memory. So all those kind of things we can now get on and do. Machine learning, obligatory XKCD. Um, if you are trying to do machine learning and you're coming from a data science background, please go and watch some of the talks from early this conference on ML engineering, data engineering, data ops, that kind of thing. It can be done properly. It doesn't just have to be that model works, ship it, run away, hope no one notices. You know, do try and do it properly. Okay, so you might think you, know, you don't have the data, you don't have the software. Now, you might not have the amount of data that Google has or, or Facebook has, which from the keynote yesterday is probably more than they should do, but your company is certainly going to be generating a fair bit of data internally. And there's a huge number of open source libraries out there now that you can build on. So if you look at the code, you'll see that um, usually I'm just doing a couple of import statements in Python, maybe do a pip install first, suck down under a gig, and magically there's all my AI stuff on my laptop. Now, interesting to me quote from Benedict Evans, um, technology is full of narratives, but one of the loudest and most persistent contains artificial intelligence and something called data. AI is the future, we're told, and it's all about data, and data is the future, and we should own it and maybe be paid for it. And countries need data strategies and data sovereignty too. Data is the new oil. This is mostly nonsense. There is no such thing as data. It isn't worth anything, and it doesn't belong to you anyway. Sorry to the people this morning who said otherwise. Um, most obviously, data is not one thing, but innumerable different collections of information, each of them specific to a particular application that can't be used for anything else. For instance, Siemens has wind turbine telemetry, Transport for London has ticket swipes, but you can't interchange them. You can't use the turbine telemetry to plan the new bus routes, and if you give both sets of data to Google or Tencent, that won't help them build a better image recognition system. 
What matters is your data for your use. The software, the tools you need, they're available, they're open source, but the models are different. If you're doing that for search, there were some great talks yesterday about how bad ML for text is out of the box with the untrained models and how good they can become with the real thing. So you need to learn about your data. You need to learn to build this yourself, and then you can build the great models. So let's see if we can help you to do that. Now, there are huge numbers of tutorials out there on um, AI, ML, and on tech stuff. One of the challenges we faced at Fleck when training new developers on it is that most of the text tutorials assume that you're effectively a Lucene committer style person in terms of your knowledge of how text search work, or that you already know all the linear algebra to do all the, um, all the ML stuff. And you'll find quite a lot of really good tutorials for getting started on image recognition and on regression analysis. But when it comes to text, the level that they start at is pretty high. So I'm hoping today I can give you a little bit of that kickstart so that maybe you can jump onto one of those other tutorials and go even further. Now, no generic talk I can give to everyone, so we're going to pick a simple area that hopefully you all know. All right, show of hands. Who knows what Wordle is? Woo! Who's not played Wordle before? Okay, we've got a few of you. That's fine. So, it's a simple web-based game um, sold to New York Times this year. You get six attempts to guess a five-letter word and the colors show you whether the letter is in the right place or the wrong place or not in the word. Lots of alternative variants out there for other languages, other styles. And then it has this spoiler-free sharing, so you get the, the little squares that you put up. Hopefully you've seen those on, on Twitter and Facebook and things as people share how they've done, but without, um, without spoiling it. So, fairly simple. Um, I cheated on this one, by the way, in case you hadn't spotted. Um, you know, you, you type in a word, you get a feedback, you try another thing, you get some feedback. Now that's kind of good for some of the AI stuff because a lot of those are kind of iterative model learning. So we can give it a hint, it can learn, we can give it another hint, it can learn. Um, the word list you're gonna need, the, um, there is one in the JavaScript, it has changed a few times. I don't want to get into trouble with the lawyers. So um, what we're gonna do instead is use the Ubuntu system dictionary. And as it turns out, about six lines of shell script will grab out all of the, um, all the five letter words from a system dictionary, remove all those pesky accents and deal with all the case normalization and give us, give us some five letter words. Um, and this is, this is kind of what they look like. So, you know, different languages, different words, which is another important thing to know is that your training data set needs to be representative of your real model. Because if we're training a model on the French, it might sort of know about um, Zouk, and then we look at the, the last couple of words in British English, and that's not there. So if we're training on one and predicting on another, that's not gonna work. Make sure that your, your data that you're training on and your real data are gonna be vaguely similar if you're gonna have any hope of it working. Do we need an AI at all? Uh, no, for Wordle, actually, they're not very good much better off regular expressions, stats. It's another question for yourselves. Do you need an, an ML in your company or can you get away with you know, an Excel spreadsheet, a couple of shell scripts, that kind of thing? You're probably not gonna get the same level of investment for your expert system, which is in fact Jane every Monday morning with a copy of Excel for 20 minutes. You get a lot more funding for this massive ML powered system with neural networks but maybe Jane is actually gonna do a better job. So, you know, do you want it to work? Do you wanna get the funding? Do you wanna have fun? We wanna have fun here, so let's push on with ML. So, if we wanna play Wordle, we need some squares. Now, as it turns out, that's, that's pretty easy in Python. Very simple thing. Run through each, each letter, see, um, see what we need. Um, the other fun thing to note for those of you interested in characters is that the um, the green and the yellow squares, they're far off down in the uh, Unicode code point space. So you actually need two characters to represent them. So that probably wouldn't have worked in most browsers five years ago. But luck luckily all the, all the fonts support it. So we can give it a try. 
um, if you're playing along at home, you know, the code's, the code's there on GitHub. You can um, give it the, the real answer and your guess, and it will print you out some nice squares. So squares, colors, all set, right? Um, so the words that are going to go into it, um, we have different word frequencies. So this comes from matplotlib, which is a really nice Python library for doing graphing. So we can see here the kind of letters that make up our five letter words. Fairly similar to the ones that you'll get in a normal length of British English words, but there's a very slight tweak because the shorter words tend to be different. However, the French ones, they are a little different. You know, ESA are the first, two, first three in English. For French, it's EAS. So again, the training does matter, but we can get some, get some nice pretty graphs out. Um, this is all it takes to print that graph, by the way. That's the, the really fun thing with all of these, um, these libraries. It's, it's on screen. I'm not expecting you to, to read all of it, but just get the sense that, whereas before, it used to be a huge amount of work. Um, when I was doing my master's thesis, the amount of work I had to put into getting one pretty graph in the right place in latex that came out on the printer. Oh, I just I don't want to think about it. Um, these days we can just we can just few lines of Python. There we are. Comes out. If you're using one of the interactive notebooks, sort of Jupyter notebooks, those kind of things, you can type this in. You can have it render on the screen, and you can do the execute, evaluate, execute, evaluate, where you're just sort of tweaking your graph, rerun it, tweak your graph, rerun it you can work in a really interactive way, get the kind of figures you need. And it's, it's not too bad. It's, it's pretty quick to write. Few key Python libraries that you are going to need to know about if you want to work in Python. Sorry to my Java developer friends out there. Other libraries exist, but they involve a lot more coding. So Pandas is a library for data frames. So working for the column store lots of dimensions, inter interacting with them, applying functions. Uh, NumPy is really, really fast Python multi-directional arrays, very, very memory efficient storage, and also has some really nice features for the way that it stores the, the data in memory is the same way that all the Fortran libraries used to, all the C libraries used to. So you can load your data into NumPy, you can call out to um, some long, long ago written library that you need. The data is in the right format. It can work on it. You can get it back. It makes it really easy to integrate with all the other tools. Matplotlib draws pretty graphs, a lot more pretty ones than I've just shown. Scikit-learn is a very easy to get started with Python library for all things machine learning. It's not the fastest to execute. It is absolutely the fastest to code in. Really simple, really good tutorials, very sensible names. You use something like MXNet or TensorFlow and they dump you straight in. There's like, okay, so initialize your tensor and then perform this dot product on it. And you're like, um, sorry, I think I've missed a vocab. Whereas Scikit-Learn, it's going to take you through it, step you through it. So if you're just getting started, I'd say Scikit-Learn is the way forward. Later on, you can hop on to one of the things that runs really fast on a GPU, you know, MXNet, PyTorch, those kind of things. But when you're just getting started, something that's mostly in English is, is going to be a good thing. Uh, if you're a Python programmer and you don't know about the Python Collections module, just go off and read it now. There are so many wonderful little things in there that will make your life easier. Order dictionaries, default dictionaries, collections, counters, all that sort of thing in there. It'll make your code more succinct. Okay, so we've loaded our data. We've drawn some color boxes. Are we good to go? Uh, no, sorry. First big thing you need to learn is that ML techniques don't like letters and words, which is very sad because that's mostly what we've got. What they like is numbers, minus one to plus one, zero to one. Um, so how are we gonna get there? Um, there are a number of ways available to us. If this is something that you're interested in, if you look back at some of the earlier Lucene talks, they'll explain those in a lot more detail. Things like TF-IDF, EM25. There's some really good textbooks online. You can lose a lot of hours reading really interesting stuff about information retrieval. I'm going to have to skip over some of that. 
but we're going to need to turn our text into something that is a feature. It's got a few, few different values, zero to one. The more features we have, the more memory and CPU we need. Um, so a few bits of terminology I've put throughout. If this is all new to you, later on, go on that Google uh, machine learning course, have a look at some of the terminology, have a play with it, learn it a bit more. A lot of the tutorials you'll see, a bit like my talk, will just throw in a word like a feature or a vector. And if that's new to you, you need to get your head around some of that terminology, and then a lot of it will make sense, hopefully. So the feature is the thing that we put in. Um, the label is like, that's an image of a cat, that's an image of a dog. Training is the process by which we stir the big data pile with the features and the labels. And then inference is at the end when we say, here's a new thing, what, what do you think it is? Uh, when we're doing the prediction, if it's a continuous range, that's generally called regression. Uh, if it's a discrete thing, then that's classification. And if it's just lumping them all in together, that's either clustering, if we know the labels, or unsupervised machine learning, if, if we don't. So we're going to be dealing with lots of text. We can encode it a few different ways. Um, the first one we're going to look at is where we just treat it as a long stream of letters and say, is there an A? Yes, that's a one there. Is there a Z? That's a one in there. So that's, um, if it was words, it would be a um, continuous bag of words. We're going to have a continuous bag of letters. So first thing we need to do in Wordle is come up with a starting word. Can we write some code to do that? Um, luckily, yes, yes we can, with only a, a few lines of code. Um, so what we're, what we're doing here is we're saying, let's treat all of the, the words just as the letters. Let's find the most common letter, which we, we did a few screens ago. So that was the E. So we say, if it's an E, that's a one. Otherwise, the fraction of E, that's going to be our score. Just sum them all together, and out comes some scores. So based on this simple scoring model, we end up with Easy's, Assess, Reese. Got some scores. Now, is Easy is a start, good starting word. Got a few people in the room who were new to Wordle. You might think, well, it's E's and A's, that's pretty good. I know there's a few of you in the room who will show me how to do Wordle, and I think I'm pretty good. Um, it's not just about finding the greens, it's also about the yellows. So we need to have something that's going to exclude those duplicates because we don't get the information. But I have this lovely list here with scores. When you're building the scoring for your ML, you need to know what a good answer is. Otherwise, you can end up like this and say, I've got a score, it's nearly one, that must be amazing, off we go. When in actual fact, that's not the right answer we need. If you or someone in your team doesn't understand the data, you can end up producing an algorithm that gives you wonderful wrong results, which is you know not ideal. So let's strip out all the words with duplicates and try again. So we can just say, count the number of distinct letters in the word. If it's not five, it's got duplicates, throw it away, apply the same algorithm. What happens then? Well, we find a rose, rays arise. And if you've read any other blog posts on Wordle, you know that those are actually pretty good starting words. So we have managed with whatever it is, 15 lines of Python, all in, to find and score and generate those good starting words. Um, we've got raise and arise. If you're doing this properly, you'd be considering the letter frequency in each of the five letter positions separately. We're not, we've just got a continuous bag of letters. So yeah, stats does win, but let's, let's move on. We're, we're pretty good. TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. It's another way of turning your, your string of words or string of letters into a score from zero to one. Would it help? Scikit-learn has a module built in. So a few lines here, outcomes, TFIDF scores, and we see that according to that, the best words are chump, dutchy, bumpy. Again, lovely score, not a very good word. 
So what's happened here is we've prioritized some letters that don't turn up too much. So the IDF inverse document frequency has boosted some letters. So we've got some fun looking words, but they're the wrong words. Try and make sure you've got that domain expert on hand to say that scoring doesn't work. It's not terrible. Um, those of you at the back of the room who know all these scoring systems will, will say, well, what do you expect here for IDF? Come on, use a better one. Yeah, it's not terrible, but it's not great. So let's try and build a bot to solve Wordle. So the first one we're going to use is multinomial naive Bayes, which is uh, a classifier. We're going to feed it the TF IDF. We're going to give it some letters and have it suggest suitable words. Um, this is all the code it takes, actually, once you've loaded up the text and built your TFIDF to build a Wordle bot using scikit-learn, which I think is, you know, pretty good. Um, how does it do? What do we think? Is this is a good bot? <laughs> Let, let's give it another starting word. Ah, and another one. No. Is anyone seeing some bugs in this? <laughs> okay, so classifiers, kind of not good here. Only ever gives a single answer. It doesn't understand about the misses, doesn't know the letter positions, and very similar words are bad, actually. We don't want something that finds all the letters, all the words where they only differ by one letter, which might fit together in vector space, because we're trying to get different answers. So. Classifiers, very easy to get started with, very easy to code on. Unfortunately, in this case, truly, truly terrible. You are going to have to try different techniques as you go on your ML journey. Try different things, figure out what works for you. What works for one person might not work for someone else just because of their data. So these are the kind of wordles that I don't like. You get a load of letters, but there's another few and lots of possibilities that you can get between them. So k-means clustering. Um, it's a system where you can try and figure out what things go together. So you could say, right, what words are similar? That's going to be even worse, isn't it? We do that for Wordle, and we're just going to get these terrible cases. And we don't really want to know what are the worst Wordle words. We can kind of find them out for ourselves every day of the week. But yeah, k-means not really going to help us. A few other terms for you to know on your ML journey. Um, embeddings and feature extraction. For those of you who've been in all of the search track yesterday and today, we probably heard quite a bit about it. Looking around, a few of you I don't recognize from those talks. So, um, we need to get a, have a way of turning our text into, uh, into a vector and a fairly small vector if we can get away with it. So with the Bayesian one that we did, we had a 26 by 6,000 matrix. That was fine. Bayes, k-means, they're, they're pretty OK with that. Most of the neural networks, they get grumpy past about 1,000 features. They tend to work really well in the, in the hundreds. So we're going to need to do something to transform our text into some kind of alternate representation where we've only got a few hundred dimensions. Um, you can rent the 48 terabyte machine from Amazon. You probably don't want to unless you're working on SAP HANA. And even then, you didn't want to be doing that to start with. You have too many bad life choices. Um, we want to try and get the, the, the size down so that it will you know, run on your laptop or run on a fairly cheap machine. So we can use some stop words and we can use stemming and those kind of things. But really treating it just as the bag of words or bag of letters. It's not a great approach. Um, we saw that we had rays and arise. We've lost that information about the position. Does that matter? Well, my Kindle is easy to use. I do not need help. I do need help. My Kindle is not easy to use. Very different sentences. Exactly the same words involved. We need to be working with something that knows about the word ordering, that knows about the meaning to it. Otherwise, we'll be um, building a search engine to point people to the wrong pages, or telling our boss that everything's awesome when our customers hate us, and then we don't sell anything. As with our terrible multinomial bot, we saw that, that the ordering does matter. 
Some other things to think about, testing and cross-validation. If we've got some data that we're going to be using for our training, don't use all of it for training. Hold some of it back so that you can check that your thing is working properly. Otherwise, you can end up overfitting on your training data. And then you end up with the cancer detection bot that learns that if an image comes from a hospital with the word cancer or oncology in the name, it's probably cancer. And then when you get all the initial images coming in from the normal hospitals, it says they're all not cancer because they're not from a cancer hospital because it overfitted. It learned on the name of the hospital that gave you the image, these kind of things. So keep some of the data back. Check that your um, system is still working on, on known good data. Hyperparameters. Has anyone heard that term before? It's the sort of giant knob on the side that the data scientists are always tweaking. Um, it's kind of any parameter that you can alter about your model that's not just the, the input data. Um, but it sounds kind of fancy and maybe justifies you a bit of a pay rise when you tell your boss, I spent all week tuning the hyperparameters for our model. It sounds fancy. It's um, like uh, three, four, five, crashed. Um, two and a half, yeah, right, ship it. Okay, if you've got a binary classifier, there are four states that it can give. A true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. You might need to adjust for those. You need to know about your system. If you're the cancer detecting bot, if you give someone the all clear when they actually have cancer, false negative, what's going to be the impact of that? If you have a false positive and you say you've got cancer and they don't and they have to go and get treatment, what's the impact for that? Make sure you're talking to your business about the impact of these errors and how they're going to affect you. Biases. Be aware of biases in your training data. Be aware that they will slip through. There are approaches you can take to acknowledge the biases in your data and adjust for them. If you just say, I'm going to hide gender and then magically my AI won't be in any way sexist, it, it probably will. It, will. it will learn some of the biases that were already there, it will learn that the first name, these first names tend to be female, these ones tend to be male. Oh, look, you mostly hired men before, so we're going to hire Alan and not Lena. Yeah, you might be like, well, we hid the gender, it was fine. No, it will still leak through. Acknowledge it's there, deal with it. Okay. Bert, Word to Vec, Elmo, who's heard of those? I know a few of you were, were in the sessions yesterday. So these are kinds of word embeddings that deal with a fairly small vector space. Um, similar words go in similar places, and the direction through the vector space has meaning. Let's just do reasoning. Berlin is to Germany as Paris is to, and it can give us an answer. It's a big part of the semantic in neural research. When they were first done, huge research projects. Now, pip install MXNet, five lines of code. It's a bit terrifying, really. Here we are. This is what it takes, using Apache MXNet to um, that third line there downloads a fairly hefty file off the internet. I mean, we're modern developers. We're cool. We're just downloading random shit off the internet and running it. It's fine. If you're not, there was a great talk before lunch on how to harden your Docker platforms. Um, but yeah, we do some maths. And how does it work? So, oh, um, I appear to have pasted. <laughs> It did work. Um, sorry. Um, if you have a look in the code, you'll actually see the answer to that. Pretend, uh, pretend it worked. Um, can this help us solve Wordle? Um, no. Knowing what the word means doesn't help in Wordle. We just need to know what the letters are. But, Symantl, anyone played that one? It's a bit like Wordle, but with semantic meaning. Turns out we can redo that in a few lines of Python, which is kind of fun. So we can, um, uh, all the code is in, is in the GitHub. You can have a play. It will calculate the distance between the different words. It will give you a hint. It turns out it's really, really hard. Um, could be quite fun, though. I didn't end up doing it because I ran out of time. Is have a Glove embedding and a Bert embedding and see if Bert can play Glove and Glove can play Bert. I think they'll do pretty well on it, but they won't have exactly the same scores because they're, they're the different models. But, you know, these things are there. They used to be really hard. A few lines of Python, a few lines of Java, off you go. Um, 
if you actually want to try and solve Wordle, the thing you want to have a look at is the Wordle gym, which is reinforcement learning. So we're going to train uh, an algorithm through multiple stages. Um, we'll need to give it a score. We'll say, you know, if you get the wrong answer, that's bad. If we tell you a letter isn't in it and you still keep using it, that's bad. Green's good. Winning's good. And then we can use the gym framework to run thousands and thousands and thousands of simulations, different starting words, apply the scoring, have it try it out. Um, in the end, when you run through, as the people at the Wordle Gym did, you end up with something that is almost always going to win in under six turns, but generally takes about a turn more than the best stats technique available. But it's kind of fun. Um, if you have a spare 20 minutes, it is worth kind of running through all that code, understanding how it works. Um, it's, it's quite a fun framework. They've also got examples on the Python um, gym website for how you can have the train escaping from the little minima by going back and forth. And uh, They've also got um, a plug-in for some of the old arcade games. So the, the, the paddle ball bouncing thing, they, uh, they show you how to train a, a little AI to solve that, which is you know, quite fun. There are, there are ways that can be done, but, but sadly, Wordle is not a great approach for ML, much better off with stats. But hopefully, as we saw from the show of hands, it's something you all knew well. So there we are. If you are interested in solving Wordle and want to be nerdy, I can recommend these blog posts. They help me a great deal with sanity checking the answers coming out my AI. And I could use them and be like, hmm, I've done something wrong, haven't I? As before, all of the code, all the data samples, and all the slides are up on GitHub. Have a play, try it out. The aim of this talk is not to build an ML bot to solve Wordle, because that's terrible. It's to give you some code that you can work through at home if you're interested, understand it, and then start feeding in your own real data, doing more tutorials, get learning. Data is the new oil, ML is important, but your data for your needs, your own interest at home. Maybe you want to have a Raspberry Pi that's going to suggest when to turn the heating down. Maybe you want to analyze some data at work and see if we can make our text better, our search better. There's lots of uses out there for ML. It's really easy to do now. Have a play, enjoy it, try it. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Anyone has questions? Would like to start? Come on, don't be shy. If it is all a bit much for you, try the code out later. You can um, send me a message, raise a pull request, I'll try and help you. There's a few people dotted around the audience who've been doing a lot more with the uh, things like BERT and including that in search. All the videos from Buzzwords will be going online pretty soon. So next week, if, if you're interested in that and you missed any of those sessions on putting this into practice, go back through. You're looking for things like vector search, neural search, word embedding, uh, Vespa. Those kind of words in the titles of the talks from the last two days will get you a real head start on putting some of that into practice for search. If you want to do it for other things, kind of work through the code, take it from there. Thank you, Nick. Okay, thanks. Yeah.